Hey, it's Eugene Liang, and I am in San Bruno, California at YouTube headquarters, and I'm excited to be joined by YouTube CEO, Susan Wojcicki. Thank you so much for coming down here. I'm excited to meet you and do this interview with you. So Susan, the most important decade of digital content and the advent of YouTube is about to come to a close. And you've been at the forefront of this extraordinary organization's evolution. And you've been CEO since 2014. I wanted to first ask, how are you feeling? I feel like it's been a really busy year. Uh, maybe that's the short answer on it. I mean, it is pretty incredible just to think about the number of changes that have happened. If you look over the decade, just the number of changes is almost unimaginable. I mean, I feel very fortunate to have been part of that, and I feel really fortunate to have been part of the YouTube experience. But I uh, was one of the first people who started working in user-generated and digital video online, and... I mean, the founders set up the first office in your garage? So Google's first office was in my garage. Wow. <laughs> um, and so that was that's a whole different experience. Yeah. But I actually started working with digital video from the very, very beginning. So before YouTube got started at Google, we decided that we were gonna let people just upload video. And we didn't tell them what we were gonna do with it. We just did this experiment. Send us your video and we'll see what happens. And all these people uploaded video. And I remember getting together with a bunch of friends at Google and we said, let's watch this video that people uploaded. We had no idea what people would have uploaded. And we watched the first video and I'll always remember that one because it was something I'd never seen before, which was just a bunch of puppets singing in a language I didn't understand. And they were purple and furry. And at the end of the video, we all just looked at that. And we said, this, that was really strange. And, and I wasn't sure how to process it. My kids thought it was the funniest thing they had ever seen and started laughing and just wanted us to play it again. And that was my introduction to just seeing all this video that people had uploaded. And it was different than what we had seen on traditional media. So we started developing much more product at Google for digital media. And I think what we discovered that was really insightful was that people, first of all, wanted to tell their stories, but also, the average audience wanted to, to see other people's stories. Yeah. And I couldn't have predicted that. And what I think about is it's very human, that people wanted to connect with each other on a human basis. And that's what led me to have conviction that this was going to be a really important medium. And I was a big advocate of Google buying YouTube. And that was almost 15 years ago. And so I'm really pleased I've been able to be here as CEO for the last five years. I've always believed in digital video and online video and online video communities. And so it's been an honor to be here and to be leading YouTube. And to give that some perspective, that first video of the weird Purple Puppets mm -hmm. was uploaded in 2005? It was probably 2005, yes. Yeah, and so just over a decade later, more than 500 hours of content are uploaded every single minute and about 2 billion logged in users are currently on YouTube. It's also the second most visited website worldwide behind Google. I feel like YouTube has in so many ways really shaped not only the way that we look at ourselves and at others through this medium, but this younger generation has essentially been shaped by the platform in many ways that I think we won't even realize until they're all grown up. I think it's been incredible. When we're gonna look back on time, I think we're gonna see how influential these years were in changing our culture, changing how we communicate, uh, and if you look back over time, there is not a lot of moments in time that have been this historical in terms of changing the way we communicate and the way we receive information. So it's an incredibly important period of time. And, and that's also why I want to make sure we get it right. I want to make sure that YouTube enables everyone to be able to, to access that information. We have such an incredible global library of information. and videos that you can laugh and learn, and the fact that no matter who you are in the world, you can access that library is a pretty incredible fact. Definitely, and I think that going off of the point that this is such a, a pivotal time we're living in that we might not be able to see from the outside right now, uh, certain decisions have to be made for a lot of different issues that come up for having such a huge platform with so many users. I really want to treat this as if I was talking with another content creator or even a sure. viewer who wants to essentially get some, some clarity mm -hmm. about certain things that have come up over the past couple years. So I wanted to start off by talking about something that's on everyone's minds, COPPA, which is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Now, creators have been 
extremely worried and frustrated over the implications regarding YouTube's compliance with COPPA and the FTC. And for some brief background, in September, YouTube and Google was fined $170 million for violating COPPA for allowing personal data on kids under the age of 13 to be captured. So creators now will be required to mark their videos and channel as made for kids or not. In your own words, can you describe YouTube's history with the FTC and exactly how these changes will affect creators, particularly those who produce kids' content? I think everyone here, in terms of the creator community and ecosystem, we of course want to keep children safe and we want to do the right thing for children. Technology changes, and as technology changes, of course the laws that govern our technology need to change too. And so the question has been more around mobile phones where the account belongs to a parent, um, but if it's shared with kids, what's the right type of COPPA experience? You know, we always had that intention, which is why we first created a app, which was YouTube Kids, that is compliant with COPPA. We are very careful in terms of what's in that app. Um, and the FTC actually didn't have any issues with that app. The issues they had were in the main app, the core YouTube experience that we have. Because what they saw and what they were concerned about was there was content there that they argued was directed to kids and was not compliant with COPPA. And so the settlement with the FTC is that we are working to make all of the content that's in the YouTube app um, to be compliant with COPPA. Now, YouTube app, um, we always said was a 13 plus app, and we always encouraged parents and families to go consume in the in the YouTube Kids app. So we acknowledge it has a lot of big changes for creators. We are, have put in Creator Studio for creators to mark either at the video level or at the channel level that their content is made for kids or not made for kids. We definitely understand that there is risk to the advertising revenue, uh, given that the type of advertising that we do is different on something that is COPPA compliant. So we can't do targeted advertising. Mm -hmm. And so that will have an impact on creator's revenue. And we acknowledge that. Yes, so the criteria that determines if a video is made for kids has been debated as vague and difficult to understand. What is being done to give stronger, clearer guidelines? So we do our best to explain the language that we have been given by the FTC. COPPA compliance applies to videos that are made for kids. And according to the FTC, what that means is videos where children are the primary audience, um, or they're not the primary audience, but the video is directed towards children. Mm -hmm. And so in those two cases, that's where the FTC is saying that we need to have COPPA compliance. That involves many different things, and they have a number of different criteria that they look at, including uh, is this content a genre that appeals to young kids, like nursery rhymes? Um, are there kids that are in the videos? Um, is it using characters or animated characters that appeal to children? Are there games, toys that are attractive to kids? All of those are criteria that are used by the FTC to determine whether or not this is a video that is made for kids. And certainly in the wording of those criteria, it feels like that's the source of a lot of people's concern. Um, they're, they're wondering, particularly people in the gaming community, in animation, in places where typically it might not necessarily be geared towards children, but they are making something for more of an all ages audience, um, that small things, whether it be visual or audible, could be considered for children and then be fined by the FTC. We have definitely heard from creators questions and concerns about um, some of the content, for example, in gaming, what does that really mean? And really what we're doing is hi highlighting those questions and concerns to the FTC. They have an open comment period right now where we have given a significant amount of comments. Um, those comments are public. And one of the comments that we made was that this needs to be a lot more clear for content um, creators, because mm -hmm. otherwise it's not as clear in terms of we're getting many questions, right, from content creators. So unfortunately, we can really only give the guidance that we have gotten from the FTC. And so it does sound like there's conversation happening right now, mm -hmm. and that this isn't something that's necessarily set in stone as it currently is. I mean, this is a law created like almost 20 years. Yeah. yeah, it was created almost 20 years ago. There have been some updates on it. They did just offer more clarification. So it is a law that is important that we comply with and that we pass on that information to creators. I just want to point out, too, that creators will make those decisions mm -hmm. themselves about whether or not they see this as content that is made for kids. Uh, and because content creators know their content best, 
and they will be the ones that will make that decision. We will not override that unless we see that there's some kind of abuse that's going on. I see. And between choosing to lose monetization by complying with YouTube's new FTC guidelines or risking getting fined directly by the FTC, the decision is resting entirely in the creator's hands, which many see as an unfair and impossible situation. And also, just to be clear, it's not that the content will be demonetized. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a different topic we can talk about. Gotcha. It will still be monetized, and there will still be advertising. There will just be a different kind, and creators can expect less advertising revenue. But essentially, those who have the Made for Kids content will see some sort of hit in the monetization in terms of their, their revenue. They will see a reduction in their ad revenue that they're generating, and they will see uh, features that are no longer enabled on that content mm -hmm. on the video or on, that, on the channel, depending upon how they designated their content. All essentially in the spirit of protecting children. Yes, on the, yes, in the spirit of not collecting any data on children. So you can't do notifications, you can't do subscriptions. I can't remember that you have subscribed to something if I can't collect any data on you. Mm -hmm. If much of the compliance with the FTC is unavoidable and true, what would you say to compel a kid's content creator to stay on the platform? We really see how incredible the content is that has been made by so many creators that has been directed to kids and kids content. We have tens of millions of kids on our YouTube Kids app um, watching that content. And we hear so much good feedback from families, um, from kids themselves about how this has really made their lives better, enriched their lives in different ways. And so we are very committed to doing what we can, um, given the frameworks of the law, um, to be able to support content creators. And we'll continue to work with the FTC to try to figure out what's the best way to update or modify the law. We are looking at ways of doing contextual advertising. So for example, advertisers who want to reach families, there are advertisers and there are ways for that to work, not using targeted advertising. And we also have a $100 million fund that we are doing um, over three years to support the family creators and other made for kids type of content. So that's news to me. I've never heard oh, about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. We announced that. What I'm about to say is not reflective of Susan or YouTube's opinion, but for, for me, um, I do find it always a little strange when government agencies essentially are trying to wait, find ways to control what children are watching. Uh, in my experience, I do think that kids are going to find ways to be able to watch something that they can't sign into personally um, either way. And for me, I always thought that giving them an avenue to see a more general swatch of content as opposed to feeling like they can't access something that is essentially now barred from them, it might push them into more extreme solutions and actually might push them to things that are less appropriate for kids. That's just my opinion. It's not YouTube's opinion, but that's just how I feel about it. Again, not reflective of, of YouTube, but I think a lot of people always ask then this should potentially be on the parents in the end to like try to be more careful about it, specifically what their kids watch. It shouldn't necessarily be on YouTube or the content creators or really even the FTC to be um, monitoring that. And that is kind of an impossible situation because how can you monitor billions of parents. So I just really hope that Karen in Ohio or whoever enacted this is happy with her pearl clutching. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that, but you know. Someone got mad first and someone went to the FTC and I never know where their true intention lies. But I hope she's happy. I hope Karen is happy. These are all lots of large questions that might not even have a clean answer particularly with children's content. This is, these, are, these are real questions. We recognize the seriousness of them. I can't tell you how much work we have done at YouTube to try to make sure that we are uh, doing what we can to comply with law, but also to make sure that we can communicate with creators and do the right thing for our audience and our creators. It is a very difficult uh, transition and we acknowledge that and we will do whatever we can to make sure that we can find a right way to manage this over the long term. Okay, I really want to get some basic vital information out there. I don't think most viewers or users have been completely informed about the process of demonetization. Can you explain in as much detail as possible how a video is demonetized or cited as unsuitable, then reviewed and then reinstated or taken down? Sure. Let me tell you a little bit about the process and then let me tell you also what we recommend for creators to do. So first of all, we make decisions around demonetization with machine learning. As we noted before, we have 500 hours uploaded every minute. Um, and so when 
we first see a video, our machines are making a assessment about whether or not this video is something that is suitable for advertisers or not. And we can look at lots of different content. We can look at the title, the metadata, the thumbnail, the content of the video. And again, I want to go back to the fact that many advertisers come to us and they want to make sure that their brand is placed next to something that they feel good about. Um, if they look at it and then they find out that there's profanity, nudity, there's a long list of things that Everything might be a problem. Uh, well, <laughs> you <laughs> the would ones need, we know that are given to You know, there are many different things that yes. advertisers would not want to have in their videos. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that happens. We place an advertiser there. They come back to us and they say, why did this happen? Mm -hmm. I don't want to spend any more money with YouTube. That's their prerogative. There are many places for advertisers to go for them to be able to spend their dollars. And so we want to provide solutions to advertisers that work for them. And then um, we give a green icon or a yellow icon. And then if the creator thinks that we've made the wrong decision associated with that, they can appeal. It's reviewed by humans. They would then decide whether or not this actually does meet our guidelines or not and could reverse that decision or could withhold that decision. We do give creators as much insights um, as we can in terms of what is actually considered advertiser friendly. We've recently updated those guidelines so that we have a lot more clarity associated with that because we know creators want to know what is advertiser friendly, what's not. Sometimes they're caught off guard and we want to make sure they're aware of what the guidelines are. I'd love to unpackage a few things. Sure. Um, first, YouTube sometimes gets faulted for being a business, mm -hmm. but the fact that we are worried about demonetization means that as creators, we are part of that business. We are looking to gain some sort of income from working within the parameters of the platform. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that where I'm most curious about is the um, machine learning. If AI is in charge of enforcing the algorithm, which it might get wrong, and then human review is brought in for a second opinion, how can we as creators trust that the correct decision has been made if some form of subjectivity might inevitably affect demonetization. Or is that notion totally incorrect? So there are two different factors, right? The mm -hmm. machines and the humans. And the machines are getting better and better and better. In fact, the more content there is, the more the machines can learn and be better predictors of whether something is appropriate for monetization or not. And every single time we tell it, no, you made a mistake, it gets smarter and smarter and smarter. And so since this first started and we uh, started rolling out machines for monetization, we have made tremendous progress in terms of the accuracy of how our systems are working. And I think you know, overall, like if you talk to most creators, like they're still going to bring up issues about it, but they're going to say that they've seen those improvements. The fact that YouTubers have given us feedback on that does make our model significantly more effective because then we know, oh, these are common areas that may, there may be a mistake that gets fixed. It doesn't happen anymore again. Now, the humans are um, very highly trained. It's not that we just ask them, like, what's your position? It's not like they just start and it's like, hey, what do you think about this? Is it appropriate for... Um, it's not like jury duty. No. There's training. <laughs> yeah. um, there is rating. We sometimes, we will calibrate those raters with other raters to make sure that they are making the same decisions consistently. So we do a lot of work to both train the human reviewers as well as make sure that we are acting in a consistent capacity. Maybe my own mistrust is from my own like nihilistic view on humanity, which has nothing to do with the algorithm. Speaking of which, yes. this is where the algorithm <laughs> comes in, right? I know a lot of people blame and throw around this term a lot, but I want to make it explicitly clear in this video what it means. Can you please explain for everyone what the algorithm is. The algorithm is a complicated set of machine learning that takes in billions and billions of pieces of data. But let me basically say that the algorithm in many ways is a proxy for estimating what your audience wants. Mm -hmm. So we have a user, they come to YouTube, we want to present to them videos that they're most likely going to want to watch, right? And so we have to predict of all of these videos, which are the right ones to show this new user who's come up. So basically, our algorithm is a prediction model of 
what videos are going to be watched by this user. And so we look at past history and what we know about that user. So based on that, they spit out a number of videos that they recommend for you. That's how your homepage gets created. That's how your watch next page gets created. So they say, based on all these different factors, these are the highest probability videos that Eugene would want to watch today. It's interesting because most people use the algorithm more in the context of thinking that the algorithm was, is what determines if their videos are suitable or not. This is another important point. How we handle something in terms of monetization is completely separate. That's great and to And there know. is no connection associated with that. Because often people will say the algorithm has decided that my video is inappropriate, therefore demonetized. So let me say, let's say we do a video mm -hmm. and the video has violence in it, okay? Now, if I do a video that has violence in it, that is one that is likely um, going to be one that's seen as more appropriate for an older audience, mm -hmm. okay? So our systems that determine which content we're gonna show to people and how we're gonna show it is gonna make one assessment associated with it. But because there's violence in the video, probably will also, our second set, our monetization systems will probably also say, hey, there's violence in the video. This probably isn't appropriate for monetization either. So because of the content of the video, our two different systems may make similar recommendations. One is like, this is for an older audience. The second one is this is inappropriate for advertising. So a lot of times people conflate those two, but they are two systems. The two systems do not speak to each other in any way. We have a creator insider video that actually goes into great length to talk about how these systems are separate. You know, in conversations where people bring the two systems together in their mind is mm -hmm. often um, discussing things that get demonetized and then perhaps not fed more widely to, to viewers. I'd love to move on to talk about something that's very important to me and a lot of people watching. Now, concerns regarding the algorithm and demonetization had particular resonance within the LGBTQ plus creator community over the past few years. And YouTube has been accused of suppressing queer voices. And although the culturally sound response is that there is no intention for this to happen, studies have alleged that certain queer themed words and thumbnails get immediately flagged. What is being actively done to prevent content that has committed no other violation besides keywords to avoid demonetization, particularly for the queer community? So for our monetization systems, we are not looking at those terms. Mm -hmm. So um, could the machine learn on its own, like well, to so, be a little homophobic, or I don't know. That's always well, the start of a sci-fi movie. Well, so right? that that's that's certainly a question that we've heard before, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons that we have come up with what we call mach machine learning fairness, mm. and because machine learning is based on data sets that come from humans. Right? And so we have humans give us information and then the machines learn from the humans. We mm. want to make sure that whatever data was fed to the machines, that we are doing everything we can to make sure that there's no bias that accidentally s sneaks into there. Is it safe to assume that much of what is deemed as inappropriate is more reflective of a general moderate audience rather than its vocal marginalized creators? So that's why we actually have a machine learning fairness team across Google. That's why we put a huge amount of effort into measuring how our machine learn is working to be able to make sure that if there's a risk that we're finding it and catching it ahead of time. We also take other precautions, just so you know. So when we make changes to how our systems work, every single time we make a change, we measure what is the impact of this change across our ecosystem. And we measure many different factors. But one of the factors that we measure is what was the impact on a set of LGBTQ creator videos. Mm -hmm. um, and we use that as an index and a way to measure and say, was there some change here that we couldn't have anticipated that would affect this content in a way that we couldn't have predicted? Um, and so that's one factor that we use to make sure that whatever we're rolling out does not have any kind of impact on creators that come from the LGBTQ community. It could have potentially, though, come in from a sort of unconscious human bias? No, because, because those terms are not terms that we look at. Mm -hmm. There's no ability to have bias. Like you can't have bias if you don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm from Texas and some people. <laughs> but yeah, in the machine sense, yes, the machines, sure. the machines, The machines only know what we tell them. Yeah. The scale of YouTube is only possible because of the machines and the ability to use machine learning. One of 
the points that I really want to make is I want to talk about how important the LGBTQ community has been for us. Mm -hmm. And we, again, take great pride in the fact that those stories have been able to be told. And um, I remember actually I was at a GLAAD event and I had brought some of my kids and there was a creator that was there and they said, YouTube has really changed the media landscape because now kids like yours have grown up and they're accustomed to seeing so many different people of different backgrounds, including different sexual orientation, LGBTQ community. I just want to say, because I think this gets misunderstood, that we really do care and we really do value that perspective. and. And we're trying to make sure that we are a place where those stories can be told. And we'll continue to do everything we can to make sure that the LGBTQ community feels as welcome and safe as we can possibly make it on YouTube to be able to tell their stories and have an audience and um, create a business. Yeah, I think a lot of people approach it with this idea of something that's very uh, sinister. You know, they think that the machines are in, in some way uh, essentially designed to to suppress. Our Machine learning systems are recommending videos to all of our users to make sure that they are having the best possible experience. And that brings up another very interesting topic I wanted to cover, which sure. was what is brought up for most people. And I'm going to disregard the trending page, which I personally feel is like somewhat arbitrary. But I think that yeah, I was wondering. I was like, oh, look, he didn't bring up the trending page. No, I mean, I think most people out there <laughs> just because I'm, a lot of other creators have, and I've talked about it before. But I, I think maybe I've had a little more insight. Um, mm -hmm. But I know that it's it's essentially just sort of giving you a smorgasbord of what is good on YouTube, mm -hmm. but not necessarily what is doing the best. Speaking of propelling content upward and forward, YouTube is considerably a more democratic space as a platform in regards to discovery and who or what a viewer could randomly watch. Now it seems for some, as it's a behemoth of a platform in its own right, that popular YouTubers who are businesses unto themselves with astronomical view counts are highlighted more while smaller upstarts and new creators, many who are probably watching right now, potentially could get more and more lost. Is YouTube actively doing anything to propel less viewed channels and new creators into the spotlight? So we think it's really important that we have new creators who are coming on the platform and that they do well. It's part of what keeps our platform fresh and, and there are always going to be new ideas and new thoughts. We want to make sure that we're a welcoming home mm -hmm. to new creators. And so first of all, just if I look at the stats, the stats indicate that we are making some progress here. The number of creators who are making either five or six figure incomes has grown 40% over wow. the last year. And the number of creators who have a million subs or more has grown by 65%. So we're actually seeing that there are a lot of creators who are hitting these important milestones at a very um, healthy rate. I think it's a normal evolution because we do have creators who have been on the platform now for longer. They have a presence. They are. It's great that they're continuing to grow, but then we also want to make sure we have new creators who are coming online. We also do a lot of things to encourage new creators and make sure they have the right visibility. So we have something called Creators on the Rise and we highlight creators there and we've seen they've done very well after being highlighted there. Uh, we also have gamers on the rise. Um, we have musicians, artists on the rise. And it's a way of bringing up artists that, or creators that we think you'd like to know that are new to you. And I would also say that still I find that I'm most excited when I see the wide diversity, especially from younger creators who are coming up, because I don't see that in other platforms. I don't see that in other mediums. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I feel like a lot of the traditional mediums are chasing essentially what YouTube has established in regards to representation and outside voices. Um, I do wonder, where does YouTube see itself in relation to predominant and emerging streaming services in the so-called streaming wars? Now, how does it distinguish itself, particularly since so many learnings these video services adapted were pioneered by YouTube? Well, we distinguish ourselves as a platform um, and the fact that we are a place where many, many millions, if not tens of millions, are coming and creating content. A lot of them are doing that professionally. And so our goal is to be able to be a platform for these next generation media companies like yourself. We think that's very different from what's happening with other companies who are competing for more scripted, mm -hmm. uh, high-end, subscription-based services. What would be your main advice for people who are looking to be able to get their videos more widely seen? 
Well, so I always ask creators when I meet them how they got on the platform, how they got started. I ask them what was their first video that was successful. And a lot of times they give me an account of where they were making videos and they were doing one genre and then something happened and they just were completely themselves. They were truly authentic. And a lot of times that was their breakout video. And I agree with that in every romantic sense of my creative soul. <laughs> However, I also would ask with all those That's tips good. and tricks videos uh -huh. where they say really fully understand the power of the algorithm or a thumbnail or a title, should people just be more well versed in uh, how the YouTube environment currently encourages videos to pop more than others? Well, I think they're all different kinds of creators and I've just heard from many, some who are very scientific and some who say, hey, this is an art. I'm going to publish what I, I think is my art and I'm not going to let the stats decide that. If it's something becomes a business for people, then they are going to probably want to invest a little more to understand, well, what kind of thumbnail works well for my users and my audience. So we encourage you to look at your stats to try to understand your audience and we think that will help you build a better video. But right. you know, again, it's also art. Everyone's going to be different. There's no right answer. Keep your hand on this boat, win a million dollars. <laughs> It's art. <laughs> I love those videos. You know they have to make them poop out of the windows of cars and boats. Mr. Beast, mm -hmm. he told me that. Mm -hmm. A rather serious topic I want to broach is what new policies are you implementing, particularly when related to harassment, that you can share with creators who are watching right now? So um, we just updated our harassment policy. And that was based on literally months and months of work where we spoke with many different experts. We spoke with many different groups um, to get their feedback. We spoke with creators, which we know have um, talked about different issues associated with harassment. And we took this incredibly seriously. And we made a number of different changes. And so I'll summarize them um, into three key points. So the first one is that we will no longer enable and will remove um, and strike any kind of indirect or any kind of implied threat. Um, the second one is a protection for everyone on what we call protected group status. So going forward, we will not allow any kind of content that maliciously insults someone for any kind of protected group status. Um, and what that means is categories like race, religion, sexual orientation, immigration status, those are all factors that you cannot use as a basis for maliciously attacking or insulting someone. The third one, which is an important one, and we spent a lot of time on it, which is someone doing videos repeatedly where maybe each individual video doesn't quite meet the standard that I talked about in number one and number two, um, but yet the fact that they are repeatedly doing something that verges on harassment and is a cause for us to take a look at that, talk to the creator who is doing that, and have consequences, whether that's removal from our monetization program, strike on the video, or termination of the channel. So those are three really big steps that we are taking to be able to make sure that everyone can be on the platform, that they can express their point of view. We don't want them to be harassed. Everyone is free to state their point of view, how they agree or disagree, but we want to make sure that everybody can be on the platform and be themselves without being harassed. How much of these um, decisions were informed by the Carlos Maza and Steven Crowder incident? That incident that you referenced is what kicked off our process of updating our harassment mm -hmm. policies. And I don't want to say it, it led to how we implemented it because we spoke to many, many different individuals and, and experts and creators and we heard many stories and issues that people had and we took all of that feedback and that's how we came up with these three key points. I will note that we never make changes just on the fly. We never have someone or groups complaining about a specific issue and then saying, hey, based on that, we're going to change our policy right now. No, we always make our policy in a thoughtful way, consulting many different experts to make sure that we can do it and then implement it consistently across our platform. Um, that was a really hard moment for us because we saw the hurt that that was causing the LGBTQ community. Mm. Um, the video was not a violation of our policies. Um, we wanted to be true to the, the policies. If the policies say something, we're going to enforce that consistently. It was not a violation of the policies, um, but yet we saw how hurtful it was. And that's why we said we're going to make changes to our policy. Uh, we're going to um, do it in a very thoughtful way. 
It's certainly a difficult decision to really go over because it's such a complex uh, topic because mm -hmm. a lot of people, to represent all the perspectives on that conflict, mm -hmm. um, one might say that the Crowder audience would cite that as these videos were just expressing something and maybe weren't directly aiming to harm Carlos. Obviously, everyone knows where I probably stand on the issue mm -hmm. as a queer person of color, mm -hmm. but to be fair, there's always this fear that there is a gray line when it comes to what is ordained as um, bullying or harassment mm -hmm. and what is simply just innocuous freedom of speech. I think for every single policy that we implement, there's always this question of what is the impact for that on freedom of speech? Mm -hmm. And our goal is to think about how do we enable as much freedom of speech, but still protect our community, still do what we think is responsible. We have made a lot of different changes throughout this year. Um, we also made a very significant change to our hate speech policy that we thought was really important because again, we want to enable freedom of speech, but we don't want people using that as an excuse to justify violence, segregation, discrimination against anyone because of different inherent factors of that individual or that group. It should be noted that the sort of conservative media that exists on YouTube is a thriving community. There is a certain amount of um, tension on both sides, whether you consider yourself more on the left or more on the right, that uh, this sort of removing of the fringe mm -hmm. is in itself sort of impeding on those First Amendment rights. And so I think the biggest question is, is there ever a line that will be drawn on either side? Because both sides do complain and scream a lot about the policies being made. Will YouTube ever take a less moderate stance with the current climate in the country where everyone is essentially um, at each other's necks and a lot of people are worried about certain groups rising more in power? Well, there are many different questions and complaints about our policies. Yeah. Um, and that was a very limited. heavy question. That was a very <laughs> It's not heavy limited question. to one side. Yeah. Um, and I will say we are a nonpartisan platform. Um, our goal is to enable everyone to be on the platform and thrive, provided that they're following our community guidelines. Um, and also, I will note that our community guidelines are done on a content basis, mm -hmm. meaning it's not like we're saying, oh, um, let's look at this individual, they come from this background, um, let's apply these policies. We don't. We basically say everyone can upload their content, um, we will look at every single video on a case-by-case -case basis. If it meets the guidelines, fine, it's on the platform. If it doesn't meet the guidelines, then it doesn't matter who it comes from. It doesn't matter how large a creator is, how small the creator is, what their background is. If it doesn't meet our guidelines, then that's content that will be off the platform. Uh, so that's the way we've approached it, is we're going to be nonpartisan, we're going to focus on guidelines that we think help keep the community safe, help it continue to thrive. And we have made some pretty big steps this year with how we handle our hate policy and how we handle harassment. And those are two uh, steps forward that, that we hope will enable voices to thrive, uh, but also keep the conversation respectful. Well, good luck with respectful, but <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because I mean, I, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of very impossible questions. I'd like to bring up a recent study by Penn State that claims that the recommendation algorithm, as it's very commonly believed, might actually have nothing to do with the radicalization of people online and that those fringe groups and people with extremist interests will be turned or already exist without the content or recommendation to turn them in the first place. From YouTube's perspective being so data-driven, how much would you say that this Penn State study was correct in its assumptions? We've certainly heard the questions and concerns around is YouTube pushing to any kind of extreme point of view. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen is that YouTube is more likely to actually bring people back more to mainstream type of content. And I say that um, cautiously because we also have lots of different types of content and yeah. we want people to explore all the different types of content that we have. But 
more often is bringing people back to content that is more widely seen, which makes sense. Like our algorithm is trying to predict what is content that people have seen more mm -hmm. that want to see. And if there's content that lots of people are enjoying, that's a reason for us to recommend that content. So that's what our conclusion of that has generally been. We have standards. Those are community guidelines. Um, we have policies, we enforce those policies. We have also seen that there's sometimes content that can be borderline. Um, and we've actually made changes to how we handle our systems to actually reduce the amount of borderline content that people are seeing. Mm -hmm. So we've reduced it by about 70% in the US. And so really our focus is making sure that all the wonderful content that's on YouTube of many different backgrounds, many different points of view uh, can thrive, but it meets our standard of our policy. This brings up an interesting point that some uh, creators have, have sort of extrapolated, which is that with the consideration of more mature content that's considerably inappropriate, and um, with COPPA, with child-oriented content, um, and what we're talking about of cutting the, the extremes mm -hmm. off because they're um, potentially harmful, mm -hmm. some people might fear that the overall ecosystem is going to uh, become more of this amorphous gray middle of the road blob when it comes to perspective, because YouTube is weird. YouTube celebrates the fact that we have so many different unique types of content and mm -hmm. we have people showing and doing things on video that we probably have never seen before. And that's really what makes YouTube special. And we also see people doing co content that is controversial. Mm -hmm. um, we're not shying away from the controversy. We're not shying away from people exposing and celebrating their individualism. What's interesting is how much of these policies that YouTube is reacting with, including the anti-harassment policy, is simply a reflection of how awful people can be online. You don't have to answer that, but for <laughs> me, uh, seeing the evolution of what we used to call a troll, who was one person in the comments, mm -hmm. has kind of become the, the norm for people to essentially create a dialogue with one another. It's, it's become the, the thing to do is to go into even this video and say the worst, meanest thing you can say about either the person in it or the other person who's disagreeing with you. And I think that uh, personally, I encourage spaces to have the ability to enact their mm -hmm. First Amendment right to, to free speech. And although I might not agree with someone who disagrees with me, I personally wouldn't want to take that away from them. Mm -hmm. We will always let lots of people disagree with you. We yeah. always want to foster debate. We en enable criticism. It just can't cross the line of being mm -hmm. harassment or being hate. I have a question about the way in which people can actually proactively affect change or protest something. Mm -hmm. Now. Many creators and viewers alike use social media and the comment section, like the one that's probably exploding under this video, to vent their frustrations and hope to garner a reaction or a response. But is there a more proactive way to get YouTube's attention? So all monetizing partners have access to reach someone at YouTube. Um, everybody has the ability to reach with chat. Um, email is another venue for many of our creators, and then there are our largest creators who have a partner manager that they can reach out and work with directly. But then we also have many people who are either viewers or they upload video, but they're not a monetizing partner. We have many resources in our help center and other areas that they could get help, but they also can tweet team YouTube handle that gives a number of responses to people that we see on the internet who have questions. Now, is Twitter really the best place to get those answers? Because people tend to always then screenshot the team YouTube and it almost becomes this echo chamber where people are getting angry. We're gonna respond. We've seen a lot of success with this, so we've actually significantly ramped up um, and we're doing 150% more than we did previous year just on social to be able to answer questions that we're hearing from creators and viewers. We care what happens, um, we're trying to respond and make sure that we have as much transparency as possible. I wonder, what do you think is the biggest misconception about YouTube? Mm. I would say there are always lots of different conspiracy theories about what YouTube's really up to. Mm -hmm. And YouTube is a place where we have people who come to work every day and their goal is to build a great service. Their goal is just like, how do we offer better videos? How do we make it work faster? How do we offer new features? How do we make more advertisers come and advertise on YouTube? And so YouTube is a company with thousands of people working hard to do everything they can for creators to build a great experience. And a lot of times we read the comments and people think that, we are, um, have some kind of ulterior goal, which we don't. Our goal is just how to build a better experience. And 
I wish more people saw that because we're really trying and we're trying to build a great experience. And do you think a lot of the difficulties that that occur might be truly because of how massive the scale this operation is because you are trying to service over two billion users? Some of it is scale, but I also think we're dealing with different audiences. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to figure out how do we make sure that creators can get what they want done, but also keep advertisers on our platform. Mm -hmm. And you know, we know, understand that there are concerns around demonetization. On the other hand, if we hadn't implemented some of the changes that we had put in place, then there wouldn't be any ad dollars at all for anyone. And that um, would actually be the sky falling. That would actually be the <laughs> sky falling. And so our goal is to make sure the sky doesn't fall. Mm -hmm. I understand um, some of the challenges. But on the other hand, most of the advertisers that were paused or had concerns have come back to YouTube. And they're spending with YouTube. And the fact that we've been able to give advertisers different options of how they want to advertise on YouTube has worked really well for them. So we're trying to balance like what works for an advertiser, what works for creators, and how do we have one place where everyone is coming together and it might not be ideal from every perspective for every one of those parties but yet the whole ecosystem is stronger as a result well thank you so much for sitting no, with thank me thank you thank you i've really enjoyed you being up here and it was an honor to meet you and thank you for all your questions this might not be included in the video but there's so much to be said about being able to protect yourself by being business savvy, by understanding how an operation is working around you, especially if you are looking to provide for yourself, whether that be on a large business scale or as a lone creator. I think being informed and understanding the best ways to push out your content while protecting yourself is like the number one thing. And if you're missing any of those points of view or that information, you're bound to get downtrodden at some point. So I always just encourage people who are, who are creating on the platform to really have every single piece of information that they can at their disposal. We agree. We also know that it's complicated. So that's why we're here. I'm trying to explain as much as I can how our systems work and debunk some of the common myths associated with the platform. And we also know creators are busy. Our goal is to make it as easy as possible and as understandable as possible so you can get on and do all the incredible work that you do.